right, everybody, welcome to our last panel of the day. I am Katie Culver from the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. I have one bit of thanks, um, a little shout out to give before um, we get rolling with our topic on um, polling opinion and partisanship. You uh, probably have seen or maybe heard the clackety clack in the backity back from all of our students and some of my colleagues who have been um, doing all the social media coverage. So I'd like to give them a round of applause. Been very interesting conversation going on in that sphere. So, and we're going to address some of that up here um, in just a little bit. So let me introduce um, our panelists today. First of all, Colin Benedict, right here to my left, is news director at WISC Channel 3 here in Madison and also does quite a bit of work with their online companion, Channel 3000. He's a prolific tweeter. He has ethics conversations via Twitter, which I love. Makes my little heart go pitter-pat. Um, he's always been interested um, in the intersection of whoop, politics and uh, politics and journalism, but he grew up at the intersection of Park Street and University Avenue, where he graduated from our fine School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Uh, to his left, I just physically, I don't know politically, um, is, <laughs> is Charles Franklin, who uh, sits up at North Hall in the Department of Political Science as a professor. Um, he's also, he also sits online at pollsandvotes.com. Um, he specializes in, this sort of geeks me out quite a bit, um, the graphical um, representation of um, public opinion and voting behavior. Um, he's, been, he's actually received awards from one of my data visualization geek heroes. So, <laughs> so I love that. I love that element of your work, Charles. Um, in, he founded, he was one of the co-founders, excuse me, of pollster.com, which many of you, I'm sure, already know of, was bought out by Huffington Post, was it last year, I believe? Summer. 2010? Last summer, okay. Um, and Huffington Post is widely regarded as a nonpartisan um, mm -hmm. outlet for all of us to learn more about um, opinion, um, about surveys, opinion trends, that sort of thing. So welcome, Charles. To Charles's left, physically, <laughs> is Ken Goldstein, also from our, our um, well-regarded um, Department of Political Science. Uh, he started out at Wolverine with a PhD from Michigan. Ken focuses on um, politics and survey methodology um, with an extra interest in advertising and is quite busy um, in that field. I'm sure we'll be hearing um, some of that today. Um, he, he does quite a bit of work on election night, um, serving as a consultant for people as they're trying to make those calls. That, that Most of us who grew up in newsrooms know that to be adrenaline central, that there's nothing like election night in a newsroom. Um, but finally, I'm going to turn to his left and hit um, Mr. Adrenaline himself, oh, Devon Shaw, Mr. Adrenaline. <laughs> who Jesus is uh, a prolific and accomplished colleague in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, where he is the Meyer Bascom Professor and also the head of our uh, Mass Communication Research Center, among another, uh, a couple of other research centers as well. Devon has always been interested in politics, but has done some really interesting new work in, um, in the area of health communication and is interested in civic participation. So, without further ado, I'm going to get to our, um, our list of many, many questions here. And we're going to start with something that, um, just a little bit of background, maybe some of you haven't heard about this, but we've had some interesting times in Wisconsin lately. Um, a couple of political issues um, involving, you know, little union things, a couple of budget things. So we'd like to um, dig into how well all of that has been represented. So I want to start, first of all, with Colin and have you lead us off, just, to, just your thoughts from a newsroom perspective. What were some of the challenges? What were some of the ethical questions that arose? How well do you think you did? How well do you think others did? Um, there's a lot to tackle there, you know. Um, <laughs> thanks for having me, first of all. Um, everyone hang on for 60 seconds. I'll tweet my answer first, and then you can read that. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, know, you know, I think that it was, certain, it was, it was and continues to be a very challenging um, story to cover. An exciting one, a lot of interest, I think. Uh, certainly all of us that work in journalism like uh, stories that people are engaged and, with. And this was a story that people are certainly engaged with. Um, there was a probably a two or three week period uh, where it was so fast and furious that it was difficult to have those types of conversations. It was difficult to step back and say to yourself, okay, are we covering our bases? What about the breadth of our coverage? Uh, how many different opinions are we have, do we have in our stories? Um, we tried to do that. Uh, I don't know if we succeeded. I think you know, that's the type of question I try to leave the viewers to decide. Um, but I know we did have those types of conversations saying, are we representing 
uh, the community? And are we representing our viewers? Are we uh, getting in different viewpoints and bringing something to, something to the table rather than chasing from one you know, press conference to the other? There was a lot of that that went on. Uh, and there was so much that was going on, it was difficult um, to keep up. But I was proud of the effort that we put in place. Um, I was having a conversation just before we started this panel about our coverage on Twitter during this event. And it was uh, certainly a watershed moment for us as an organization to say, uh, to see the response from the community. And there was, there was such an interest in it, uh, and there continues to be, but during the time where things were happening so quickly, really the most efficient means we had to get information out from some of our reporters in the Capitol was through Twitter. And um, I think people recognize that. Certainly, um, the feedback we got was very positive. Uh, but there were times when, as, even as news managers, the way that I was keeping up with uh, Jessica Arp, in particular, in, particularly in the Capitol, was to watch her Twitter feed. And uh, it's, a, it's a different experience for a news manager, quite honestly, because, you know, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the fact that news managers tend to be control freaks, but, um, you know, this information is going out. And the value of Twitter is that it's going out in real time. And you have to give up some of that control and step back and say, we are serving the public in a different way. And then and try to answer some of those other questions. But it's, it's probably a topic that could take up an hour, so I'll leave it there. Well, absolutely. Well, we could just read all, all Jessica's tweets. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I thought was interesting um, in following her, also a graduate of your fine school of journalism and mass communication, uh, was, how, uh, was how much people were um, tweeting at her to try to get their opinion out through her feed. So I'm going to, with that, turn to Charles and ask you, um, as someone who studies this in depth, um, to tell us a little bit about what are some of the pressures on journalism when it comes to r properly reflecting opinion? Is that possible? Tell, tell us a little bit about what you think. Well, um, I guess I don't actually know how to answer that question. Uh, <laughs> so answer a question you'd like. <laughs> Those are the best questions. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, it's the ultimate essay exam. Uh, it goes to, in part, if you go back to the beginning today when we were talking about NPR and listening to people talk about how balanced they think it is and how it picks up this and picks up that and is sensitive to this need or that need. Well, in the eye of the beholder and the producer, maybe that's true. It's not necessarily true in the eye of other beholders. And I think that's the lack of appreciation of diversity that we often see. We're self-satisfied with our product. We know our vert values are good values and our goals are good and noble. Um, but there's a tremendous diversity in the audience out there and the partisanship of that audience and the way it receives media, the way it filters it and interprets it and agrees and disagrees with it, I think means that no matter what you produce, there will be strong negative reactions, just as there will be strong positive reactions, but both of them will be significantly driven by opportunistic op op moments of, oh yeah, that guy proves I was right about Walker all along. And it doesn't matter whether it's the left or the right, you're looking for the opportunity to seize on that. And so to that extent, I think uh, the kind of conversation we had this morning is kind of misses the point completely about the partisanship here on the audience side. It's not only the producer's characteristics that are partisan, it's also the receiver's characteristics that are partisan. <laughs> so I'm going to ask a prelims-like follow-up question to that. What should journalists do? What should news organizations do to better take that into account, to understand yeah. that? And I'm going to throw that open to any of you if you'd like to talk. John, Devon had a kind of a big nod going on on that, on that point. Uh, I just have learned to agree with Charles. <laughs> Smart man, you get an A. <laughs> Please, Charles, go ahead. No, I, I, I think the answer, honestly, is uh, you take your integrity to your product and you put it out. Mm -hmm. Screw them if they don't like it. <laughs> Could you tweet well, that, please? <laughs> I, I would, but, but, I mean, but how does that play back in the newsroom? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would agree that it, it, from my perspective, it feels like the audience is more partisan than ever. Uh, the feedback that we get, I mean, literally, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, I got a call from uh, a, uh, a viewer uh, who said that one of our news anchors uh, was presenting a story and at, at, a, at a, a 
a point in the story, she tapped her finger on her script. It was literally like this. I went back and looked at it. And to that viewer, that was an indication of bias. That was her emphasizing that point in the script, and it clearly showed that she had an opinion about that story. Now, I looked at it, and I thought it was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard. Um, but I think there is no doubt in my mind that the audience is paying attention more, that they're um, more engaged, but that they're also more partisan, that they see what they want to see to a certain degree. We have to do what we think is right, and I think we tried to do that. I guess the one thing that I would add to the screw them mentality, um, <laughs> which at some point I think you do have to say that to yourself. You have to say, we are right, we think we are right, we made the best decision we can, and we put it out there. Um, but the other thing that I would add to that is that you have to be open to at least listening. You know, we do, we try to do a lot of that. And um, I'll pro I'm probably more accessible on Twitter than anywhere else, but, you know, we take seriously the emails and the phone calls and the Facebook mentions and the Twitter. We take all that into account. It does shape our coverage. I don't always agree with the person, but I do take it into account. And, and I think more than ever, we have to at least listen. We don't always agree, but, um, and there will be those moments where we have to say, you know, this is right, what, regardless of what the audience is telling us. But uh, that's how we try to approach it right now. So let me turn to you, Ken, and ask, what did polling tell you and tell others about the situation in Wisconsin? What's, what's the picture that we should be seeing? And then, related to that, did you see that playing out in our state media, national media? So there's sort of a general polling question in the state and a specific polling question in the state about, about the budget battle. And where the, where the issue connects is, I've been here since um, 2000. Um, I don't think the biggest newspaper and the best newspaper in the state has sponsored a poll since I've been here. There are really no good media polls in the state, period. Um, and when you look at it and actually go through Charles's database, but I think if you look through the Wisconsin statewide polling, well over 90% of the surveys are IVR done by Rasmussen or, or PPP. Can you just say what IVR is? So IVR is robocalls, would be the, would be the, uh, would be the lingo, <laughs> I guess. And PPP is a, is a Democratic firm. Rasmussen is a Republican firm. People criticize each for their partisanship. People criticize each for, for their methodology. One can look at the data and take the value. But the sorts of high quality polling from a news organization like we see with ABC News, Washington Post, CBS, New York Times, NBC, Wall Street Journal, Pew, we simply don't have in the state of Wisconsin. And there really hasn't been any high quality media polling since I've been here in 2000. Now, my, uh, my, uh, my dog in this fight is, I actually did a poll during, the, during this. And it was a poll that was sponsored by um, Wisconsin Policy Research Institute. Um, and I've done a number of polls for them over, over the last two years. And you know, if you want an example of hostile media effect, that's an example of hostile, well, certainly it's an example of hostile. Um, <laughs> an example of hostile media effect, right? So in 2000, which is a good year for Republicans, shockingly polling shows things are good for Republicans. So Democrats in the state go nuts. Um, and then uh, the survey that I did in March, also sponsored by WPRI, which is clearly a conservative-leaning organization, but they gave me complete control over all of the survey work. As we know from your open records. As I know from my open <laughs> records, exactly. Um, so same me, same methodology, same, same phone house, same everything. Public opinion had moved against, um, against uh, uh, the Republicans and Scott Walker. And we put that poll out. And of course, shockingly, Charlie Sykes didn't like that poll. He only liked the other ones. Um, and you know. I take it quite a badge of honor, and those of you who aren't from Wisconsin wouldn't necessarily know these names, to be criticized by um, uh, Scott Ross, Ed Garvey, Charlie Sykes, and Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> 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 
four people you don't want to have at a cocktail exactly. party. I don't, think, I, don't think, I don't think I could be proud of to have, to have to be criticized by those four. But listen, um, so I did a good poll. Um, and, uh, and it was a completely transparent poll in every way, shape, or form. That said, we should be in a world where that high quality poll, which is also expensive to do, is being funded by journalists. Because we were simply flying blind. And then we got to this little Supreme Court race, um, and there was, I didn't see any yep, there was none. polling of any, not to mention good polling or bad polling. You could just look at the $6 million being spent on ads and figure things were, were close, because people who invest in campaigns don't invest in blowouts. But there is a clear, clear need at the state level, not only this state, but other states, for there to be high quality, transparent survey research. How here, about here. nationally? Nationally, we, we really do have a lot of yeah. transparent, available, high quality survey research. I mean, Charles could give you more than I can, but um, I mean, right off the top, it's ABC News, Washington Post, CBS, New York Times, NBC, Wall Street Journal, Pew, Gallup, um, you know, absolutely high quality, expensive, state of the art uh, polling techniques, doing cell phones, best practices. You just simply do not have that at the, uh, at the state level. In and so states, just to toss state. in, Ken's WPRI poll is, I think, the only one in the state that does include a cell phone component, mm -hmm. for example. So that's why you get criticized by both, <laughs> by both sides, all sides, I guess. Uh, so Devon, actually, let me, let me pick up on that. And, and I want to come back to something that Hernando brought up and stole my thunder in the last panel. But I want to come back to that hostile media effect. Um, you know, should we be trying to report opinion? Should we be doing polling um, when we have everybody saying, well, you tapped your finger three times uh, while, you were, while you were doing your call. I dismiss your results. So what is it about people's response that should affect how we do this in journalism? Um, well, to build on Ken's point, you know, you can look at other Midwestern states that are a lot like us. Minnesota, for example, the Star Tribune has the Minnesota poll, and it's been doing rigorous, high-quality research around that for, you know, quite a long time. Uh, people who've headed the Minnesota poll have been heads of the American Association of Public Opinion Research, the Midwest Association of Public Opinion Research. So they're not only doing high quality polling within media organizations, but they're esteemed as good quality pollsters and they're doing high quality work. Um, I think it's essential. I mean, I think the dearth of available information uh, during as this budget battle unfolded, you know, those of us who were more poll hungry were hunting around for poll data. The best you could find was Rasmussen polling, some robocall polling sponsored by the AFL-CIO. I mean, it was really low quality. And then the WPRI poll came out and everyone said, oh, thank goodness. Um, and I think it's critical. We need that. Um, going back to Hernando's point about kind of hostile media, you know, I, I think, you know, we, we have a public that, especially in this state, and especially what we saw in the, uh, uh, the Kloppenberg-Prosser election, clearly is very divided. Uh, literally almost 50-50. And uh, we, I think, have a media environment to credit for that. In some respects, we have uh, a, a lot of us are encountering uh, ideas that tend to mobilize us, but maybe making us more polarized as well uh, through social media. I think we're seeing that um, through the patterns through which we consume uh, news media. I brought a little handout, because Charles has slides. <laughs> So he's more fancy than me, but I brought a handout. Uh, um, we get like an overhead. So exactly. No, they yeah, have a document. <laughs> about yeah, it. print media are alive and well. Exactly, print media lives. Here it is. So I'll, I'll, you want to hand that out? And, and you know, if this is just a I listing, love working this is available uh, through actually a, a friend of Ken's, uh, Will Feltus, who did the report showing just how different our media consumption patterns are between Republicans and Democrats. And what you'll see here is. Um, you know, the most popular show among Republicans is Glenn Beck. The most popular show among Democrats is Keith Oberman. Not surprising. Both of them will be off the air. Or one's off the air already. One will be off the air shortly. Um, but then, you know, you notice this even when it comes to entertainment media, we see great divisions. So part of it, I think, goes back to Charles's point. Are we talking about partisan media or are we talking about a partisan audience that has different preferences and styles and choices and interests that are getting reinforced in, in spaces like social media? And you know, I would add to that, you know, we're, we're doing some research right now based on Ken's advertising data showing that 
We live in a battleground state. One of the reasons we're as polarized as we are is because exposure to political advertising tends to polarize us, tends to strengthen our political affiliations. And we've been getting you know, inundated with political advertising in the state over the last how many election cycles, Ken? Since 2000. Since 2000, it's been you know, every two years a massive dose of political advertising. Um, and you know, that's only happening to states like Wisconsin. That's about one third of the US. Two thirds of the US does not get that heavy dose. You know, couple that with social media, couple that with uh, uh, the news media environment. And, and you know, the other chart I brought that I don't have this as a handout is just how partisan both the Fox and CNN and NBC audiences have become. They've become polarized in terms of who seeks out what. So I think it's a, it's a, a really big phenomenon. But I, I'm going to take one last moment to disagree with Katie, because Katie said we had to disagree with each other. And she thanks, I begged him. I said, we're the last panel. Let's fight a little. Let's fight a little. So I'm going to fight a little <laughs> bit Shake with it Katie. Up. <laughs> and I'm going, to, I'm going to say that Katie thanked the wrong group. And I think the, the group, that, the person we should be thanking, and I'll take a moment to do this, is Mr. Burgess over there, without whom this conference and the Burgess chair, and I know Stephen would take the time to thank him. So thank you. <laughs> That's a great okay. way to get yourself applause, too, by the way. You also <laughs> stole my thunder. Well, sorry. <laughs> I was going to close strong, man. Yeah, well. <laughs> All right, but since you, since you took us digital with your mention of social media and how those use pa usage patterns um, may be adding to our polarization, I want to explore that in a little more depth. I want to know what you know, and I want to know what your experience is in the newsroom as well. Um, I, I, Charles, you said something that was fascinating to me um, when you talked about the um, infl most inflammatory or virulent comments on Pollster, you said they were on a certain breed of story yeah. or breed of posting, and I was really surprised by it. So let's dig into that a little sure. bit. Yeah, it is interesting, but ultimately not surprising, maybe. But um, we started to see a phenomenon. Pollster went live in August of 2006, and this was true more or less from the beginning, but certainly became very apparent as we went through the 2008 cycle. And that was, not surprisingly, there's a lot of virulent commentary. Uh, as my partner, Mark Blumenthal, said, you know, a lot of this you wouldn't want your daughter to read <laughs> um, in pleading for people to pull back. And we tried some things that you guys are talking about to make comments uh, a little more personalized, to make people take a little more responsibility for them. But, but the surprising point was this. Mark and I would spend hours writing analytic pieces and um, Emily, our, uh, the, the person that updated the polls constantly, and a, would, and a UW grad, political science. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, not journalism? <laughs> it might have been a double major. She must major. have taken some might courses. Might have been a double right? major. Um, um, would update them with just the results. So here's the latest Gallup poll of so, show and so and so. Here's the latest Rasmussen show so and so. We got a bigger volume and far more virulence on the items that just reported the result of the poll with zero commentary, with no analysis or anything, whereas the longer analytic pieces that Mark and I would work on uh, produced a good bit of virulent commentary, but nowhere near the volume and nowhere near the um, uh, language, shall we say, that appeared. So I just thought it was very interesting that people would actually like to fight about whether this, you know, 52 to 48 lead that one pollster was showing uh, was the corruption of polling and proved the bias of the media, et cetera, et cetera, um, rather than fight over the things we were saying in our analytic pieces, which were by their very nature more judgment-based, more, you know, the kinds of things you could have a good fight about. You know, Franklin said this stupid thing, let's tear him apart. It happens um, all the time. But instead, we would rather fight about whether it's 52-48 or not. And I, I just found that quite fascinating. Anybody want to anybody want to dig in and think why? Why would that well, be? I think, why I think are we fighting speaks, about the number? I, I think it feels directly to the point Hernando was making earlier, which is seemingly neutral information, if it counters the viewpoint you hold, seems biased to you. So if it's, it's 52 against and 48-4, four, why is it showing that? You know, it's within the margin of error. They should have reported them. You know, they'll find something to pick on because they view that, and, and it goes back to another point that, that Hernando mentioned, which is it's not just the perception that that polling is reflecting some kind of bias, 
but that the, ref the, the, the public presentation of that poll will further bias, right? That, that essentially the news of that poll showing that a majority has a viewpoint different from the one that you hold you think is gonna be persuasive on the public in some way, in the same way that people see somewhat biased coverage as being persuasive uh, uh, in terms of its influence on subsequent opinion. So I think it's about uh, the fear that that means uh, opinion slipping away from my side, support is slipping away from my side, and then it goes back to the third point Hernando made, which is the notion of corrective action. That's when people want to take a response. They go online, they leave a comment on Charles's blog, they go to a, a, a newspaper article and say something vicious. Now, that's a form of engagement, I suppose. It's maybe not the one that we imagine as the most democratic, uh, uh, democratically uh, uh, kind of sustainable or, or beneficial, but nonetheless, it's people becoming passionate and about and connecting with politics. But I'm going to ask an ugly follow-up question to that, and I think it's one that I, I, I know um, I have you know, plenty of experience with reporters and editors who are exhausted by being in the middle of, of that battle, by having a, um, a photo on the front page that they get slammed from the left and the right, that it's biased, that seeing the exact same photo, they both see it as hostile. It's very, it's, it's, it wears them down. <laughs> um, but is it also going to eventually kill their audience? Will there be an audience for journalism that tries to strike it right? If people are moving more toward partisan support for their own views, to partisan media outlets that support their own views, is that, is that going to kill the Collins in the long run? Well, I hope not. Because, you know, I have a, a family to, to uh, feed. But, um, you know, I think that. I think there will be. You know, I still think in the world that we live in now where information is so readily available, there is still, um, and I find that I, I feel this way as well, I need someone in many respects to decipher it for me. I'm not talking about the local news that we cover every day, but um, you know, I'm talking about anything that you're interested in. I'm interested in soccer. You know, I. Well, I go to a trusted source that I know is going to decipher the information for me and give me what I need to know in an efficient manner. I still think there is an interest in what's going on in our local communities and for someone to be able to relate that to the audience in a trusted way. Um, I still think there's room for that. I, you know, I, I don't believe that it will be crowded out by the partisan media at a local level, although I wonder if that would be successful. Uh, in a local media sense. So I don't think the answer is, I don't think any of us know the answer, but I just know that the busy lives that all of us lead uh, these days um, actually, I think, makes room for that trusted source to sort it out for us. I don't have time to do my fact checking on this political ad, but I trust that you guys are doing what you can. Now that doesn't work for everyone, um, but I think there will be. I mean, I think there's, a, there's an easy, <laughs> potentially interesting way to answer this question, and that is Kent wanted to go, but I like cutting him off. Uh, um, Here comes my fight. The, the, you know, we could look at what, what was the number of page views of the uh, Isthmus's daily page before and after versus, or the Capital <laughs> Times uh, uh, news feed before and after versus something more neutral like Channel 3000. Mm -hmm. and see where in a, in a highly politicized, polarized political environment, where do people go? And I suspect that, that the jump or the rise in viewing of things like the Isthmus's daily page skyrocketed, skyrocketed during that period. So I think people in those moments try to seek out information that's resonant and supportive. And uh, does that mean that the kind of balanced, uh, journalism is doomed. I, I think that it's certainly in some trouble. I think the general pattern we're seeing, if you look at what's happening with broadcast media, if you look at what's happening in terms of audiences for uh, uh, different news outlets, I think we're seeing uh, that kind of polarization at the national level. Um, you know, the, the nightly news broadcast audience is shrinking uh, uh, compared to what we're seeing for cable news, which I think is taking a more partisan position. So I think that's just one hint of maybe what we're going to see at the local level. I mean, local news in general, uh, again, uh, uh, Channel 3000 aside, doesn't tend to cover local politics very well. I mean, that's been demonstrated not just, I'm not talking about Wisconsin, nationally, Ken and Erica and others have done research looking at the amount of actual political coverage 
happening locally, and local news tends to report on national politics, ironically. You know, they're not doing a lot reporting on local politics. So, Ken. <laughs> so, I'm building on a couple things that Colin and, and Devon said. One, I think that distinction between local and national is crucial. Um, clearly, the national environment is phenomenally fragmented. The local environment is less fragmented. And, you know, I assume you know, local news you know, here is also, doing, is also doing research on their audience. And it is, you know, local television news, certainly ratings have gone down, their shares have gone down, but they still are the main source in, for, of, of, of news. In, uh, in, local, in local media markets. So there is that distinction. The other sort of, you know, when Colin talked about going and looking for, for soccer, <laughs> or even other real sports, right? You go look for, look for information. Um, um, one of the reasons why there is so much money spent on television advertising, which is incredibly inefficient, is they know that most of the people paying attention to media in the first place are already a fan, you already like the Democrats and Republicans, number one, and you're not going to be able to convince them. Number two, they can self-select to their particular fan site, right? And it's the caricature, but it's true, right? Republicans can go to Fox, Democrats can go to, to, go to MSNBC. So you're looking for people who aren't fans, you're looking for my wife who only watches the Super Bowl, right? <laughs> and you don't, you don't find that sort of person on Fox or MSNBC or any of these other things. You may still find them on the local news, and they may be turning into the local news for the sports or the weather or some other, or, or to get news on local stuff going on, and then you can get them with, with your ad. But, um, you know, there's a couple different dynamics. I think good, solid, nonpartisan news coverage may in fact be doomed because I think the next place that people are going to look is where there's audiences and where there's money, and that's in local television news. And is there a way for them to steal some of your advertisers by being more partisan? I think, that's a, I think that is a serious danger. So there's that local, national, I think they're going to start looking for ways to peel off local. And then you're going to get even more of the paid media. Because even if it's only 5% are undecided, you've got to find them in a way that they don't self-select on their partisanship. I think there is a distinction. I mean, I, I agree with Ken in the sense that I think that there is the possibility for a partisan organization sort of around the Fox News model to work at the local level. I'm quite surprised actually that it hasn't been more aggressively tried up until now. But I think that there is a major distinction between the, nas the national level and the local level. Still in this community, if one of my anchors is partisan, that person goes to the grocery store, that person lives in the community, there's a certain um, local factor that I don't think is at play in the national arena. Um, I think that um, I'm not saying it can't work and I'm not saying it won't be tried and it won't be successful, but I, I do wonder about the dynamic there and, and whether or not there's an appetite for the real partisan give and take to be happening in your community. It seems okay if it's on this large nas national distant thing, but um, I just wonder if it is, doesn't translate to the local level in the same way. Well, well it happens on radio, doesn't it? It does. I mean, we That's see it point. there. I mean, I think it's a matter of where this is starting to kind of become entrenched and where it's going to develop next. I think Ken's point about, mm -hmm. you know, revenue models and people going where the money is, I think, you know, again, local news audiences still remain relatively large. It's something where there's, there's red meat there and there's going to be people who are going to go looking for it. So I don't doubt that that's something where we'll see erosion in that category coming up soon. And we see some, I'm actually just finishing a report so it's fresh in, fresh in my mind. Um, there's some distinctions in different media markets in the Midwest nationally about 
who watches or who pays attention to different sorts of communication. Milwaukee happens to be a place that skews very Republican on radio and skews very Democrat on TV and is actually sort of in the middle on its, on its newspaper. You can look at a Columbus, Ohio, or a Cleveland, or a Des Moines, or an Indianapolis, which is more Republican than Milwaukee, but the radio doesn't skew as much Republican. Um, and I think, you know, national political folks are also paying attention to that as well. Fascinating. Well, a little depressing, but fascinating. Although I'm highly offended, and I'm going to post a comment that you called it red meat, not blue meat. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so Charles, you know, I know you didn't bring a hand out. You went all digital on me. <laughs> I, I wanted to give you a chance to talk yeah. through um, okay. what, what you want to show here and, and, um, and illuminate us a little, a little bit. <laughs> Well, set. Okay. You um, you're going to flip me <laughs> off, are you? <laughs> Usually, it's only my students that do I that. Turn off uh, your microphone. That's fine. Um, I, I, I just, since polling was part of the title of this, I just wanted to show a little bit of evidence about this and put it in some perspective. So, these are President Obama's approval ratings until yesterday. Um, Every little dot is a separate national poll. The blue line is a fitted trim to that. Standard look at, at his uh, polling. When we break it up, one of the big divisions at the first half of this period is Gallup's daily poll, which is done in blue, versus Rasmussen's daily in red. And partisans and, and others noted what a large gap there were between the um, uh, Gallup and Rasmussen, uh, and you know, con con uh, people on the left certainly believe that that was proof positive of Rasmussen's uh, conservative bias. But what's interesting is how that has vanished in the last year. If you look at the right side of the graph, there's almost no distinction, no consistent distinction between Rasmussen and Gallup anymore. And there's an interesting side question of why. But if we bought, if we bought the premise that Gallup was intrinsically the pro-democratic pollster and Rasmussen were in, was intrinsically the pro-republican pollster with some evidence from the first half here, we'd be hard pressed to explain how they suddenly lost their political values um, to move to the second, second half. If we look at each individual pollster, these are all the pollsters, you do not need to read them all, um, that have done at least 10 separate national polls over this period, and the vast majority of them have done quite a few more than 10, you can see some variation in them. If you look at the very top, ABC Washington Post, high quality polling, as Ken and I agree, but you'll notice the red line for the, for the pollster is consistently above the blue line, which is sort of the trend or average across all the pollsters. Uh, if we one of my favorites, if you look at the Ipsos McClatchy, about three down here on the left, the red line stops because uh, McClatchy changed its pollster and Ipsos started working for Reuters. The interesting thing is when you move to Reuters, the red dots come a lot closer to the blue line than they did when they worked for McClatchy. Is that a uh, partisan judgment about McClatchy or is it something they changed in their methodology or what? The point I'm trying to make here is if you're a partisan, looking for a pollster you like. If you're a Dem, you're going to love ABC Post. If you're, gonna, if you're a rep, you're going to like Rasmussen or you're going to like Zogby. Um, if we look here are the ratings of all of the pollsters, something called a house effect in it. Basically what it is is on average how much above that blue line for all the pollsters does this particular pollster fall. And so the one furthest to the right is the most pro-Obama, uh, that is to say the higher approval rating for Obama. And the number one position is ABC, the second Ipsos McClatchy, AP, CNN, CBS, Gallup Daily, and so on. You come down to the bottom, those to the left are the most uh, lowest, lower ratings on uh, Obama approval. Harris the most, YouGov Parliamentary, Zogby, Rasmussen, Quinnipiac. The one that's dead in the middle, Daily Coast, PPP, and right next to it, Fox News. Those kinds of things don't fit with most people's perceptions of where these <laughs> pollsters fall. And uh, the point is that mostly we pick our pollsters and we decide who we like based on 
which party we like, not about anything specific to the pollster, uh, let alone the data. And the, I'll just leave this up, but the punchline to this is that there's a variety of pollsters, uh, a, a variety of results. And it's not because I claim any of these pollsters are biased. They use different methodologies, which are reasonable choices given uh, professional standards. But they provide an opportunity for that partisan receiver of this information to pick the one they like and to then fight to the death claims that that pollster is the best pollster and anybody else is terrible. Um, and the last little bit here is a change I've seen in the media in the last few years. When we started pollster.com, it was extremely rare for one media producer of polls, say ABC, to ever mention a competing news source and their poll. So ABC, Washington Post, would never mention CBS New York Times. Even if it had been three months since the last ABC poll and there was a more recent CBS poll, they would just ignore that. What we see today as a version of that is the concept of quality control or what ABC calls airworthiness. Is a poll up to the standards to be used on air or in a report? And one of the biggest areas there is the refusal of mainstream media, the elite media, to accept IVR polling, these interactive voice response polls or robo polls, push one if you approve, push two if you don't. <coughs> a lot of reasons to be skeptical of those polls, but interestingly, it's not based on their track record. They've actually done a pretty demonstrably good job of predicting election outcomes compared to the more expensive pollsters. But this reached its height in 2009 in the Virginia gubernatorial election, where none, including the Washington Post, of the, of the major media, the elite media, paid for any polling. And so the only polling available for this hotly contested Virginia governor's race in 2009, one of the races that set the tone for the shift from Obama to Tea Party, was that there were uh, half a dozen to a, a dozen polls all by IVR. The Washington Post was forbidden, its reporters were forbidden by the standards not to report any of those results. And yet it was those results that were driving all of the political conversation about the race. And I think that refusal to acknowledge other people's work, but balanced against a very difficult choice. What is a low quality poll, one that we shouldn't report? Uh, would the evening text poll that <clears throat> Channel 3 runs every <laughs> night uh, now start to qualify as something that's airworthy? Uh, well, I guess it is airworthy. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, yeah, Colin. Not, not, not <laughs> I didn't plan to go there. It just kind of popped out. I have one of my Katie's, Katie's student interns on a campaign to get rid of those text polls, by the way. Just, just so you know. they're, they're coming. The morning ones, even though I would like to win a free trip to Chula Vista. Yeah, sure okay. I, think, I think Charles's point is really critical here, which is one of the things, and this is you know, a conference being housed in a journalism school, how important it is for us to teach journalists about quality polling and about... Um, you know, using SurveyMonkey to conduct polls is not a public opinion poll, right? Uh, uh, it's, you know, we have to actually talk about the methodology behind this, and it's gotten increasingly complicated in an environment where you have higher rates of non-response that have, you know, made generating a, a truly representative sample more challenging. There's some evidence to suggest those lower rates of non-response aren't contaminating the kinds of results we're getting to any great extent. Scott Keaton and others said about two percentage points off. Uh, there's, there's other evidence that says we're missing a lot by not having good cell phone samples and the need to start to really build up our capabilities in terms of how to generate good cell phone. The variability in quality in some of these differences are house effects. I mean, they're differences based on the methodology that's used and not an inherent bias on the part of the polling organization, right? Those methodologies produce certain consistent biases, which is what we're seeing, but I think we also have to be careful that it's not necessarily stemming from an inherent partisanship, right? So if we look at the kind of continuum there, Fox News is pretty close to on target. NBC, which is also MSNBC, the, is right on target. CNN, which would claim it's probably the more moderate or neutral of those cable news networks, is 
producing poll results based on their partnerships that are, that are more on the liberal side. I mean, I think we have to start to be aware of the, the house effects as a pattern here. And I think things like Pollster and 527 have done a good job of pointing those kind of factors out. Ken. So I, I think the key is for people in newsrooms to have some quantitative expertise. And then it also goes into, I think, something that everyone here touched on. There's different, different news organizations, to the extent they do have a policy, have different policies on what they report. So. Um, ABC News, where, where Charles and I work on election night, basically koshers certain polls and doesn't kosher other polls. And if they say a poll is not reportable, it absolutely cannot be mentioned on any single ABC News platform. How about the they, blogs? Nothing. Zero. They won't even... Can't they, be mentioned. Can't even stick it on the page? Can't, can't, hmm. can't be mentioned, and hmm. the person who does that will actually go and call out reporters if they, if they mention a polling police. Mention a poll that, that, that's not been, um, that the quality is not being vetted by, by them. There's other news organizations which will just report anything, or, you know, or, or pollster or Real Clear, and they've made a specific decision for Charles not to go and be a geek on every single poll and try and say this one's better than the other ones and just to say, hey, we're going to take all polls and we're going to do an average and we think it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to work out. Um, there's some news organizations that will take any poll that they think is sponsored by a nonpartisan but won't take any poll by a partisan organization. Well, you know, so Democracy Corps, that's Greenberg. Mm -hmm. he, he knows what he's doing mm -hmm. when he's, he's polling. And that's AP uh, standard, isn't it? AP will not do anything. Right, this is their standard that you just absolute described. Standard, mm -hmm. Absolute standard. So when you take a state like Wisconsin, and many of us were talking with partisan pollsters, and so a Jeff Barron's doing polling in this state, a Mark, Mo Mark Melman's doing polling in this state, public opinion on the Democratic side, public opinion strategies, and Terrence is doing polling on the Republican side, and frankly, their numbers were excellent. Mm -hmm. And you know why they're excellent? Because, because they have a vested interest mm -hmm. yeah, in getting it right. They, they have a vested interest in, in, in being accurate. That's right. Okay, and being high quality and high quality polls. So I have a point of view about which model I would use, but it does depend on there being a level of expertise about surveys. And I guess what I would say for journalists, you know, circling back to, to polling and how folks should cover it. You're dealing with data all the time. You're dealing with information all the time. And if you're doing your job as a journalist, you have the skills to be able to put that data into, into context. And I think it's the exact same with polling or any other sort of evidence. And the problem is most journalists, even at the national level, not to mention at the local level, don't have the skill to put that into context. And then sort of one last point, which goes to why you get so much venom when you have polling stories, is they're numbers, <laughs> right? Yeah. You just numbers are really powerful things. And journalists, and it's also like catnip for, for, for the media, right? It can be really complicated to cover a story, or you can say this is the score, right? Think if you had to describe a football game, but you were not allowed to use the score. Well, now we have this supposed score which is polling, and the easy thing is just to say the number. And I'm, personally, I feel the more numbers, the better. But if it is going to be the more numbers, the better. You have to have the skill to be able to report it and put that into context. So, am I, I mean, you know, when I dig into something like Pollster, I get all intrigued because they'll have this sophisticated question where they, you know, put a poll in the field and they tested whether it makes a difference to say, do you support restrictions on, new restrictions on collective bargaining or do you re support new restrictions on collective bargaining rights? They're actually testing the question of the influence of the word rights. So my question to you, is there, is there hope for news organizations because polling has gotten better? You've gotten better. In, in coming up with these numbers, which means they may be more reliable than they were 20 or 30 years ago. Are we doing better? I, th I think to some extent we are, but in other ways not. One issue is beat reporters. You know, when you had a good beat reporter, 
uh, who stayed on the polling stories. This was especially true at the AP for a long time, national AP I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you got people that may have started out as wordsmiths, but they actually learned the numeracy they needed That's to right. cover the beat. Uh, it's much harder to do with a general uh, assignment reporter, uh, both at the local level, but also at the national level, where I think there's less of it. The, um, you know, the other aspect of this is putting things in context of not focusing on a single poll, but taking whatever the latest poll is and putting it in the context of the other polls that came before it. So at Pollster, we were frequently criticized for including whoever you hated. So we'd be criticized for including Rasmussen on the one hand or for including Gallup on the other, depending on whether the critic was from the left or the right. Um, you could prove, demonstrate with our little wiggly lines, that it made no difference if you took them out because the methods we used were insensitive to that. But the more important rule was never cherry pick. And if I had one thing I would say to reporters, it's don't cherry pick the data. That's this difficult, and I admit it's difficult, divide between quality control on the one hand and picking just the polls that you like on the other. Because the partisans will always cherry pick the numbers that are best for them. Duh. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, the, but the journalist who only picks the latest poll and reports that one latest poll, no matter how straight that report is, if it's not put in the context of the polls that came before it, it's a peculiar form of cherry picking as well. Would you agree and, with and, that? Can I, and, yeah, sorry, would you absolutely. agree with that if it was the, the poll that Ken says we need, and I'm not yeah. here to disagree with him, in fact, I would love to do that <laughs> poll, but if we only reported yeah. on that poll, would you feel the same way? Yeah. I, I think, again, the, 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 yeah, my bottom line, and demonstrated in the history of, of Polster, was whether we loved it or hated it, we included it so that people could see if this poll was in line with other polls. If it's an outlier, it sticks out as an outlier. If, back to the graphs above, if ABC is consistently running above the trend, readers ought to know that and understand it. Should also know that as the trend goes down, so does the ABC. All of these pollsters track with the trend. They're just shifted up or they're shifted down. That also is valuable information. But uh, the false belief is that there's one best poll and one best pollster. Uh, I collected data on something on the order of a little over 2,000 polls conducted during the 2008 campaign. Went to their home websites. I must have found 60 pollsters who claim to be America's most accurate pollster <laughs> on their websites. It almost goes without saying it'll be on the front page of their website. It was ain't one of, a bullet with a bullet. A bullet. <laughs> Hit a bullet with a bullet. Uh, it, so the, the bottom line, though, is simply, you know, <laughs> openness is the cure here, right? Seeing the pollsters in their context and compared to their competitors is by far the better way to reveal that. I think, rather than an editorial judgment that rules some pollsters out for some reason. But I admit it's not quite as easy as I make it sound. Where's the line between personal interviews with cell phones, IVRs with no cell phones, online surveys with non-random samples, text polls to the TV station? You know, I don't want to make it sound easier than it really is. There is well, and, and I think one of, the, one of the ethical challenges therein is that the, the, big, the biggest threat from our business model implosion has been the loss of specialization that you both, actually all four of you, have touched on at different points this afternoon. That until, uh, unless we have someone who's capable of numeracy, unless we have a news organization that's capable of doing a, a, a well done and expensive, really, really expensive mm -hmm. poll, without that, without that support, what can journalism do? How can it serve local and state um, in, in a way that national is being covered? But I think what has happened, actually, is that news organizations have retrenched from reporting polls in general. There are some that still report a wide variety, but I think at the local level, there has become so much skepticism about not the validity of the poll, our ability to make a good decision about it, 
Um, and then the feedback that we will get as a nonpartisan organization taking a poll from Rasmussen and putting it on our air, that it has perhaps wrongly made us retrench from reporting polls, period. I think we reported one poll in the Wisconsin Union debate, and it was mm -hmm. Ken's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we took heat for that, even. Yeah. You know, uh, I re we decided to report it because I knew you, you know? I mean, it was easier, easier for me to make that decision. Um, and I'm not saying that it's right. I'm saying that's where we are right now. I think that the, f the amount of feedback that you'll get when you put a poll out there, period, in a nonpartisan media, um, is probably what led the AP to make the decision that they made. And, and mm -hmm. I personally don't agree with that decision either. But mm -hmm. I also have to try to make decisions for my news organizations that are in, best, in our best interests and in serving the public. And maybe, maybe we don't have the skill set that we need to make the right decision. Yeah. So you guys work for free, right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Or for the university, whichever's cheaper. Uh -huh. uh, I, I just want to say one thing here, though, that uh, one of the news sources in the state that did do polling during the union debate was WisconsinReporter.com, that organization that declined to be here this morning and that uh, is sponsored by the Franklin Center. Uh, and uh, I found it just very interesting that they were one that did sponsor and pay for uh, one of all of seven, I think, statewide polls that were done during the controversy. All right, we have time for a couple of questions. Oh, I think we've got one right up there. Oh, we have more than a couple. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to cut to the chase. On any major issue when there's a poll, there seems to be incredible variation in the results. So why should anyone take a poll seriously, and what, are, what is being done to address the credibility chasm? I'm going to answer well, that right here. Well, while Charles runs to get it, I think he's going to show you a slide that shows there's not incredible variation. That's what it is. <laughs> OK? This is Obama's approval rating over time. The blue line goes through the middle of the points. Yes, there's variation. The points spread around it. More than 90% of those polls are within plus or minus four percentage points of the trend. That's exactly what the theory of polling says it should do. And so if I pick whatever this horribly low poll is right here at the bottom and compare it to the horribly high poll that's nearly directly above it, I can drive a narrative that's exactly what you said. But it's simply false for the vast majority of polling for that to be true. I mean, just to build on that point, the, one of the things that we, and this goes back to Katie's question too, one of the issues that we cover, I teach a class on communication and public opinion, is first looking at question wording, right? So if you change the wording of a question, what happens? And I'm sure a lot of the virulent comments you get are about this poll was asked the wrong way. And I think there's increasing sensitivity about question wording differences and how they can bias poll results or poll, poll results in one way or the other. And we've learned about push polling and other phenomena. But by and large, you know, the way to look at this is by looking at the trend. And so what I have my students do is find the wording of a question they think is relatively neutral or even if it's biased in a particular direction, look at the trend over time, because that's what tells you something, is how it changes over time. And if you have multiple poll points, you'll be able to observe what the real trend in opinion is. Right? Now, that's not to say that polls are free of concerns or issues. I think you're right that there's a lot of public skepticism about polls. I think some of it comes from being misinformed about how good polling is done and about the variance in quality that exists, because everything, they're getting numbers from text polls and internet convenience polls and everything else and comparing it to what's coming from uh, high quality RDD with uh, cell phone matching kinds of surveys and the difference in quality is tremendous and so it's not surprising the difference in results are big too. I just wanted to get to an ethics question again. Uh, if, if, if partisans are driving the news, which is part of where we seem to be going. We're ending up with a, a lower information population. And if partisans start to drive the news because we have to react to all of those pressures, where is the information we really want to get out? As a, as a consumer, I would like information. If I, if I want to actually participate in a democracy successfully, where does that put us ethically? 
Well, you know, I mean, I think at the local level, um, I think there's a big distinction between the local and national level. I'm not sure what you're speaking to, but, um, you know, I think at the local level, we, we still feel like we are driving information uh, as opposed to, um, you know, the partisan rhetoric that we're getting. Um, you know, I think that's where we would like our focus to be. We are talking a lot about doing more fact-based reporting. There seems to be a, a strong appetite for that type of reporting. Um, and I think we've seen a good response to that, too. Um, so if you're talking specifically about polling, I think I, I have concerns about how we're handling <laughs> polling on our station. I would like to have more confidence to put more polls on our station and on our website. And, and you know, that's a challenge for us to figure out how to do that. We're trying not to be. I mean, yes and no. I mean, I guess it's, you know, it's tough to answer that question. We, we've always, news is a reactive organization in many cases, but we're trying to do more analytical pieces. We're trying to do more fact-based pieces, partly because that's what our consumers are asking for. Um, you know, it isn't because that's the type of stuff that we like to do, although we do. It's because we're getting a lot more of those types of questions from our consumers saying, I don't understand this, I need you to sort it out. So I think there's, there's still value in that type of reporting. And that ties I, nicely I, I, to what Tony was saying today, and, and that we need to be more than catnip. So it's not, it's not just throwing the numbers out there. Whatever the shape those numbers are, uh, is, um, it's providing context and analysis. I, I was just going to give uh, WISC credit as uh, I don't think any newspaper in the state has paid for a poll in 10 years. But uh, Channel 3 actually has paid for polling, even under recent uh, financial distress. So, and how well uh, did that work out for Well, it, it's, it might, but that's the issue. But, but the point is, somebody deserves a little bit of credit for trying to do it. Uh, uh, and Wisconsin Public Radio, of course, for uh, their, un <laughs> I wish it were better funded, but <laughs> consistent effort there. So. All right, we have Scott, and then I think we'll wrap up with Alicia in the front. This kind of goes to some of what you've just been talking about, and I'm just curious what everybody thinks about this. Um, you know, we all like to be on the winning side, and we all like to know what's going on with the polls. During the health care debate, one of the key talking points was 70% of the American people, or whatever it was, are against this, so why should we do this? During the debate in Wisconsin, what we heard nationally anyway was, well, you know, whatever percentage of the people of Wisconsin believe that the collective bargaining rights should be preserved, so, so this bill is bad. So the, the polls are substituting, at least to some degree, for the debate about ideas. Um, you know, I mean, we all, and we all love the polls, but I'm just kind of curious what you guys who live and breathe polls, what you think about that. Are you comfortable with that? Um, what does it mean? Well, I'll say quickly. Um, I'm relatively comfortable in that um, the polling did consistently show more opposition than support for the health care reform. There's a lot of variation to give the due over here that there was variability in that depending on how you ask the question. Yeah. But I think the overall picture of where the balance was was pretty clearly demonstrated across hundreds of polls. And likewise, the, the much smaller number here in the state. Where I think the bigger question is in the agenda setting function of polls, and especially when those polls may be conducted to drive a storyline. Um, in a less nefarious version of that, you look, we're coming up on it, uh, early primaries for the presidency, Iowa, New Hampshire, are, and especially in 2007, <laughs> it wasn't even 08, right? Uh, there were few pollsters active in a lot of the early states, and at least one of those pollsters is a pretty consistent outlier away from everybody else. And in particular, that one showed unusually high levels of support for John Edwards, but with no other polls in the state, no way to check it. What we saw during the health care debate was a website, Fire Dog Lake, that paid for polling in Blue Dog Democratic districts in order to try to create and drive a narrative there. And again, as long as interest groups are going to drive a lot of these polls, and we don't have an independent check from a less interested party, uh, I think there I'm far more worried 
than I am when we've got dozens of polls. I love it when we have dozens of polls. To be scared is when you have one. Ken? Yeah. You know, two things. One, when I first started working in polling, my first job was with the CBS News election unit. And I sort of, the, the hotline had just come out. And you know, only 50 people got the hotline. And because I was working there, I had all this information. And it was really easy for me to be smart because there wasn't the web. <laughs> um, now, everyone's got it, right? It was a big deal then that you, know, you could read the LA Times because I was you know, sitting at CBS New York. You know, I didn't read any newspaper in, in, in the world. So there was lots of polling going on there. I was seeing it, political professionals were seeing it, but nobody else was. And so we're now in a world where it's, it's, it's less elitist, quite frankly. Every, everyone's, everyone's seeing it. We're a little bit behind the curtain. And then I think consistent with that point, all the dangers that you pointed out, the dangers that Charles pointed out of, of getting public opinion wrong and not having an influence on public policy is absolutely accurate. It's not like that didn't happen before polling. <laughs> Instead of polling, you'd go and you'd knock on doors and you'd talk to seven people. Or you do, you know, man on the street or person on the street interviews, which were probably just as misleading as a bad poll. Now maybe the poll seems a little bit more scientific, but I bet if you went back and some grad student, you know, go back and look at characterizations of public opinion in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. I bet there were still lots of characterizations of public opinion. It just wasn't based on polling. You know, the only thing I'd add is that I think it's curious that, that we have more kind of counter-checking or fact-checking of polls now than we ever have, in the sense that, you know, three election cycles ago, two election cycles ago, we didn't have 538. We didn't have pollster. We have more efforts to look at aggregate poll data to make that publicly available so people can make judgments about what they think is actually happening. And those are very well visited, very widely circulated. The information from those was shared and disseminated. So in that sense, I think the polling data, I think, has gotten more accurate, more rich, and there's been more, uh, even within the polling community, cross-checking of that. I think that also speaks to Ken's point about kind of democratization of information. Um, even if we're in an environment where we have more partisan sources, we also have more ability to seek out multiple sources, right? Um, and I think that's an interesting kind of counterpoint to this that I haven't heard discussed a lot, but I'm curious as to what other reactions might be, which is uh, most of us used to read one newspaper. Now most of us read six or eight, at least looking at the headlines, the topics that concern us. Uh, that certainly provides a diversity of perspectives too. And I know I purposely seek out a variety of ideological perspectives in the news media you know, I, I tend to frequent because I want to understand what different perspectives are. So, Maybe the environment's richer than we assume, uh, even as it's becoming more partisan. And I, I think if Stephen were here, I think he would be making this comment that I think we have a shared ethical responsibility to encourage that kind of literacy, to encourage that kind of seeking out of multiple sources of information. That's a public ethic. That's not, that's not something that people um, should wish would happen. It's something we should all encourage to happen, at least. Um, Charles, would you tell us what happened with WisconsinReporter.com's polling? And then, uh, for the life of me, I don't still understand why the discrepancy uh, with the polling at the beginning of 2009 and why it came together. Right. Um, <laughs> we'll ignore that. <laughs> I think this speaks for all of us. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, uh, I'm definitely doing it. Um, um, I think the... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, that just sort of freaked me out. Would you say, <laughs> say it again? Yes, yes, Wisconsin Reporter uh, paid for polling by a, uh, uh, a unit of the Rasmussen Polling Company, uh, which is now selling polls to anybody that wants to pay for them. Um, so it's exactly the same methodology that Rasmussen uses, both in the good side and in the bad side. Um, and my point is that they, well, they, it was actually, it was quite in line with the other polls that we saw. It showed a significant majority opposed uh, taking away union bargaining rights and a significant majority favored bigger contributions to uh, uh, benefits, which is exactly what every other poll in the state showed. Um, and 
So in that sense, not out of line with the other results, reported on their website um, and distributed to whoever wanted to distribute it. Um, my point is simply we're talking about new media outlets and what are they doing and the constraints on uh, traditional media outlets. And here's an example of one, uh, a new upstart and, and with uh, um, uh, a bit of a, of a tilt, uh, perhaps. Uh, but I, as far as I could tell, the poll was, uh, you know, was in line with what other people did. And the discrepancy between the Oh, in the Obama approval? Yeah. Uh, that one's a lot more interesting to try to figure out what's going on. It could be a difference in the way um, public opinion. I don't want to get too off in the weeds here. If there is some sampling bias between the Rasmussen phone poll, which is this IVR robo poll, and Gallup's, which is personal interviewers on the telephone, live people on the telephone, okay? It may be that as the public came to learn about Obama and as the events of 2010 unfolded, those discrepancies between those samples tended to wash out as people became a little more homogeneous in their views and that modest difference in samples disappeared. But that's purely speculation. One of the drawbacks to this is to fully answer that question, you need access to private proprietary data you can't answer it just from looking at the data as it, as it is, but so, my best guess. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I, I mean, I can't speak for any of you, though. I know, I know we would all cluster around a center somehow, but I, I just have to say how grateful I am to have this kind of expertise. I mean, international expertise on our campus here in this little mitten of Wisconsin is really, it's just, it's so gratifying. And then also to have um, such a model of ethical practice in all forms of media, online, did, um, Twittering, on TV, in print. Um, it's just been, it's been a very um, refreshing conversation, I think, and also, also incredibly informative. And now I have all sorts of, of um, evidence to take back, back with me and say to my students, this is why I make you think about numbers. <laughs> all right, so thank you to all of you. Tell them to take college. Drive. <laughs>